teams like Wilkinson v Downton and Genovia versus Sweeney. What is mentioned in this in this um, So we are continuing with the uh, Glanville Williams article and why are we doing that? Because in our notes on uh, jurisprudence in the legal theory module of our notes, we had looked at this aspect, which is a very important aspect of understanding uh, adjudication in common law countries like India, where uh, you have this doctrine of uh, the stare decisis rule. Uh, so precedence and precedence get cited in the court. So then the question and precedence have to be followed. So the question is which part of the case are you which part of the precedent are you going to follow and that's when we we understand that we follow only the ratio decidendi so to understand which is the ratio what is the ratio decidendi of a case how it is to be uh, extracted that is one of the things we are trying to learn through this Glanville Williams article and then we will also distinct uh, discuss this idea of distinguishing this get into the meat of how uh, uh, you know precedents are used in legal arguments all right so let's go back to the Glanville Williams Williams article where I've tried to highlight most of the uh, I think we stopped here right we stopped here and so what we are trying to do is uh, you know how to find out the ratio decidendi of a case so we are focusing initially on the Wilkinson versus Downton case which you saw that where this guy scared a lady by telling her that her husband was injured and then she suffered a nervous shock so then the lady was awarded damages by the court because the court came up with this rule that whoever in willfully this is the rule that the case so remember in ratio decidendi i've given this definition at the top of your page of this particular article i've inserted some of my writing here which is that in ratio decidendi we want to talk about the uh, because remember we have to distinguish ratio decidendi from arbiter dictum okay arbiter dictum is all the kinds of other stuff that the court will say because judgments are very long and very often judges are not very disciplined uh, especially in modern day India they're not in, in the 50s and 60s we had judges like Hidayatullah and Vivian Bose who gave, gave brilliant judgments very very precise but nowadays judges are not that particular so you can actually get very rambling judgments and you have to really be careful to understand what exactly is uh, the ratio and what is there and the rest of it is all arbiter okay so uh, therefore uh, we have to be able to so 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 in that context to distinguish ratio from arbiter what we have done what I've done here is talked about a, a slightly different uh, uh, slightly uh, different uh, definition of the ratio decidendi which is like the bare minimum minimum reasoning let's put this as reasoning or logic required to reach the decision in the case of course we have to write the here but i'm not writing it so you understand that when you're writing proper english when it comes to written english communication you'll find that if you want to write good english you'll be using the word the a lot okay and sometimes it gets so when we are looking at like uh, trying to work quickly sometimes i might just omit the but you have to understand that that should be used in, in good writing okay so in ratio decidendi what we are trying to understand is the decision that the ju judge arrived at in the case what is the general reasoning what is the bare minimum general reasoning that we need to arrive at this decision to justify this decision because obviously a decision is not arbitrary it has to be based on some logic right whenever you rule something that somebody should be hanged because he has committed murder and the punishment for murder is this and how why did we say that he committed murder because of the circumstances of this case so every decision has some reasoning behind it it's not something that just they just decide and and let you know they have to know uh, tell you the decision the logic for arriving at the decision and that's what you have to understand that the bare minimum logic is the ratio decidendi and the rest of it is all arbiter so we'll continue here with uh, what the for the first point we're trying to understand today is uh, how are we going to extract the ratio decidendi of a case? This is what we are trying to understand today. How are we to frame? This is one of the important roles of this article to help you to understand that. So what he's essentially going to say, I'm not going through every line in the article, but I will just uh, try to highlight some of the important facts, uh, important uh, uh, points. Okay. And the rest you read on your own. And then you ask me questions if you don't understand. Okay. So as he said here, he's given this definition before uh, facts and the decision on the facts. Uh, but 
here what he's talking about is, is uh, this is the ratio that the judge laid down in Wilkinson v Downton so Downton was held uh, liable uh, to pay damages to Mrs. Wilkinson because uh, what the judge determined was that he willfully did an act if you just focus on this part which I've underlined he will is the font big enough Priya is the font big enough okay all right okay so uh, uh, he, the judge determined that he willfully did an act which is calculated which was calculated to do harm and do, uh, did indeed cause physical harm to mrs downton so this is a general principle as you can see here he's not mentioned the name of uh, downton he's not mentioned the name of wilkinson but he has tried to make the the judge has tried to lay down a rule in in giving his decision on the case that why is this guy downton being held liable because he willfully did an act which was calculated to cause harm and did in fact cause physical harm to the plaintiff okay and this is the ratio of the case all right so this is one level and as you will see some the ratio actually gets widened uh, you can understand the ratio at different levels of abstraction okay what we are trying we will explain what is meant by different levels of abstraction uh, but uh, let's look at something else that they say here which is that here so they that they're talking about a uh, a different case which comes up later remember wilkinson v downton is in the 1890s and this this other case jambia versus sweeney comes up in 1919 where you have the situation where uh, a guy threatens a, serf, a foreign servant girl and he tells her that unless she gives him some information he is going to prosecute her okay so then the girl became obviously maybe there are some problems with her immigration status so she was nervous and she became ill with distress when she was threatened in this manner because the guy said that i'm going to report you to the police and all that so therefore uh, this girl became ill and then the person who made the threats to the girl was held liable and by the court and in doing so the court uh, essentially what 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 they're saying here they approved wilkinson versus downton that means that the court remember this now at this point in 1919 this becomes a precedent because wilkinson v downton came in 1897 i think okay so at this point when this case is being argued in 1919 this is already a precedent is that clear to everyone right a precedent a case which comes before on similar facts right and therefore the uh, lawyers are going to argue that because this is a similar a ca case on similar facts this current case should also be the 1919 case should also be decided in a similar way right that's going to be the way they use uh, that's how they use judicial precedence sir? yeah sir who is the victim and who is the perpetrator in jangler versus Sweeney? here uh, in this case it should be if the uh, they have not given the names but typically how it will happen is see who is the one who fell ill who he is the one who the one who suffered right so remember i mentioned this earlier that when you look at cases right uh, the defendant is mentioned uh, later the plaintiff is mentioned first okay so in this case if we assume that uh, obviously the the girl is the one who suffered uh, you know you have to look at who has suffered the detriment right and who is bringing uh, the action before the court so typically it is the person who has suffered the detriment who will bring the action before the court so in this case we will assume that the girl is uh, javier and sweeney is the person that she is charging with causing her distress okay so this is how yeah I like to say that this case is of like the direct precedence. It's precedent. So can't it be persuasive? Because like uh, in case it, it can also be seen as that the if they want to get some information and a foreigner is foreigner that is in it. So can it be like uh, another factor that is coming in between that can change the? Yeah. So you are actually already hinting on a point which the author has touched upon later on in the article. We'll just mention. We'll just look at that. But you're right that this can be. Uh, you know this can be argued both ways okay so I just mentioned that it was a precedent I didn't say it was binding but what they what the court took is that the court uh, accepted this rule in Wilkinson v Downton and in fact they broadened the rule a little bit which you'll see okay as he's discussing but you're right so this is just going to be cited initially as a precedent and obviously the court uh, the lawyer who's citing the case will try to say that it's binding because he wants it to be followed and then the court will determine whether it's binding or not 
I mean, if it's not a, that's when we get into distinguishing and all that, which we, when we discuss this later, you'll see when we discuss distinguishing. Okay. All right. So, uh, so this is basically it. So in, in Javier versus Sweeney, what they're approving Wilkinson v. Downton, and they're essentially saying that again, this girl, person has done this act, that is the act of threatening the servant girl. And because of the threat that she received, she became ill with distress. Okay. So she was called, she was caused physical harm by the act done by the particular person who did who made the threat and this caused her to become ill and therefore she is entitled to damages from this person all right and so if you see here and so he's talked about this other way of uh, I'm just trying to follow the sequence in the art the article is actually not uh, very well sequenced because uh, he could have uh, put some other stuff uh, in a, he could have put in a different sequence but I'm just going to follow what he's written in the article so that's easier for us to go up and down so what he's saying is another application of the uh, principle is here's the principle that he's talking about willfully doing an act which is calculated to and does cause physical harm in the case of Wilkinson v Downton the harm came from the physical harm came from the psychological stress okay you know this idea of psychosomatic problems right you heard the expression psychosomatic somatic means pertaining to the body but psycho means pertaining to the mind okay and so obviously as you know uh, in, in the case of humans you have if you are very distressed you have tr severe emotional stress it can there is a connection between the mind and body so if you have severe uh, emotional stress that can have physical it will have a physical impact as well right so in the case of mrs wilkinson it came from the mind but what this uh, author is saying is that the same principle can be applied when the physical harm is actually happening directly to the person right like in the sense if i am driving a car directly with the intention of hurting someone i drive a car straight into this person so that's obviously hurting his body directly without doing any uh, psychological damage so he's saying even then the same rule will apply because I have cal in a deliberate manner I have caused harm to this person okay therefore I should be liable to pay damages okay so here so what I'm here to, what I'm just trying to get to here is that uh, here what he's saying is that this what is involved in finding the ratio decidentity of the case is a process of abstraction okay what does he mean by the process of abstraction abstraction means essentially looking at various levels looking at the same phenomenon at various levels it's all like almost like using a different zoom zoom lens uh, uh, for each level so in the sense like i can look at one level of abstraction is to look at a geographical area as a city i can look at it as a city or i can look at it as part of a district i can look at it as part of a state then a country and then i can look at it as a continent then the planet then the galaxy then this and the solar system are you are you following what i'm doing here at each level i'm becoming more and more macro i'm zooming out more like from city to district to state to country to continent to planet right at each level you're going higher and higher is everyone following that yes yes sir. yeah so that is what is meant by level of abstraction so initially you try to understand the rule as it applies to the particular facts of the case that this guy Wilkinson this guy Downton told mrs. Wilkinson a lie that her husband was actually injured but when he was not actually injured he told her a lie and what was the purpose of the lie he was basically he wanted to enjoy seeing her getting frightened and uh, he wanted to get a kick out of it so that's why he told her a lie so but and then obviously he, uh, it caused her distress so you could actually state this principle at the level of telling a lie but what the author is pointing out here is that I think he's talked about it somewhere here um, where has he talked about the fact that the the lie is okay I'm, I'm not able to find it right now uh, yeah he's mentioned it here that the ratio omits to mention the particular lie it doesn't even talk about a lie it talks about an act okay because a lie is a subset of acts okay if you say an act is more general than a lie because a lie is one type of act okay so even in the first level of the statement of the ratio of the case it does not say willfully lying it talks about willfully doing an act all right 
okay so uh, which is calculated to so so willfully doing an act is more general than saying a, a, a lie so you have already moved a little bit higher than the actual facts of this case that's what is meant by different levels of abstraction and different levels of generality essentially okay so here uh, I'm just flitting around in the article a little bit but the point we are trying to get at here just to understand that that when you are understanding the ratio of a case you can understand it at different levels of generality like different levels of abstraction okay in more general terms so willfully doing an act is more general than willfully lying because there could be other types of acts which are not lying this is clear are you following this idea of general and particular that lying is one type of act but there could be other types of acts which cause harm but which are not lying which don't represent lying is this clear yeah okay so this is what he's saying the article is not very well organized so i'm just flipping up and down a little bit but the point we're trying to dwell on right now is that the idea that it can you can understand the ratio decidendi at various levels of generality and uh, therefore the application uh, it is either very wide or it is a very narrow principle okay so here he's talked about it can apply also the harm can be directly on the plaintiff's body also and then let's look at this part here yeah so this process of abstraction he's given you another example of abstraction so if you look at a dog it can be either seen as a terrier okay it's a breed of dog then it can be either a dog or it could be a mammal animal okay and so on and so forth right okay so that's what he means by level of abstraction the higher the abstraction the wider the ratio decidendi okay so obviously if i'm applying us the rule at the level of states it's higher than it's more general than something that is applied at the level level of cities right because there'll be many cities within a state so that that is what we are trying to understand here okay so that's why it says uh, instead of tell a lie replace tell a lie by doing any act that's a wider uh, principle right and the idea is that when, so the question is then where do you stop how, how when do you stop making it a more and more general rule so the idea here is that is you have to use your judgment and we are trying to essentially uh, evolve you have to use your own judgment about what what should be the law in a particular case so it's not a mathematical formula okay you'll see there's some logic involved but it's not a mathematical sort of formula so you have to use some judgment as to how do we want to guide people's behavior in society remember all this is based on all the laws are based on one they have only one purpose which is to make people behave properly why do we say that murder is a crime because we don't want people going around murdering other people okay so we want to incentivize people and we want to make sure that their behavior is uh, controlled in such a way in, uh, in a way that we can have an orderly society so when we are when we are evolving rules like this uh, how should uh, under what circumstances should people be held liable we want to make sure that they behave in a responsible way towards other people and that's how we are evolving the rules so you have to use this kind of judgment in deciding where you stop okay so uh, that's what he says here okay now let's look at uh, this particular case that um, yeah so let's look at one more example of how the uh, the ratio of a particular case can be made a little bit wider a little bit wider made a little bit more general okay like what you saw in the wilkinson versus downton case is that we have talked about the word willfully okay willfully doing an act which causes which is intended to cause harm and thus cause harm okay that was wilkinson v downton but if you look at the jobia versus sweeney case which is the foreign servant girl who was threatened with prosecution okay if you look at that case what happened there in that case was the um, let me take this um, I don't like to make everything bold because then it becomes like how do you know what is important with um, So what we are saying here is in this case the person who threatened the girl did not really want to cause her harm he didn't really want to feel see enjoy seeing her you know getting distressed and all that that was not his focus so there's a slight difference between this case and the wilkinson versus downton case so in this particular case the court has actually widened the they took the ratio of wilkinson v downton and made it a little bit wider 
because what they said was in this case this guy was not really intending to uh, directly that was not the focus of his uh, actions that to see her getting us uh, distressed he basically wanted to make her go with him and help him in a particular task and to make that happen he made this threat so he was not directly focused on making her uh, you know distressed but the point is that he was reckless you understand what reckless is reckless very easy to understand with respect to driving okay so if i'm driving yeah not cautious not cautious not uh, you know uh, not showing the the reasonable amount of caution okay so yeah it is dangerous you can say dangerous so reckless means if i'm driving recklessly it's not that i actually want to hit somebody uh, with my car but it's just that i'm driving in such a at such a high speed on a narrow street okay which is quite uh, you know there are lots of people uh, lots of people and cars on that street so in that case if i'm driving at a very high speed my actions uh, are so obviously likely to cause harm to people that i should have paid attention to it are you following what i'm saying recklessness means that uh, my actions are so uh, are, are such that any normal person would be able to see that i'm causing a, i'm posing a, i pose a high risk of damaging other of causing harm to others but i am not changing my behavior okay it's not that i directly want to cause harm but i'm just kind of callous you understand callous careless, careless and callous and i don't care it's that's basically it you know so nonchalant care so negligent so reckless uh, reckless uh, driving so what he's saying is in this case this person was reckless so even when what is happening now i have to now start deducting marks so kushbu will open the account kushbu and uh, single so they will open their accounts we have to do this now otherwise people will not behave I don't really want to interrupt my this because my my own flow is also interrupted. I have to no, not K. Where is this? See, I don't really like to do all this, but we have to do this to make people behave. Same problem, just like making laws. When you want to make laws to make people behave, so. Um, So Kushbu will open her account, and so will Single. You are Tanshi Single, right? Okay. So we'll have to keep doing this now, and this will keep piling up the score. We'll keep it here until I get the team scores ready. Uh, okay, and uh, so right. Let's go back to this. So this is a problem here that you know it also interrupts my flow, and then uh, I have problems going back to focusing on what we were discussing. Okay, so we were discussing recklessness, right? Reckless driving. So we were discussing recklessness. So what the court is doing in Jambia versus Sweeney is, while they approve of Wilkinson v. Downton, but the rule that the judge laid down in Wilkinson v. Downton was that he has to willfully do an act, right? That's what the judge laid down in the Wilkinson versus Downton. But here the court is saying this is a good rule, but we can make it a little bit wider. That even if you are not willfully, directly intending the distress of the servant girl, but your actions are so reckless that you should have see foreseen. Any normal person should have been able to foresee that your actions will cause her, are likely to cause her distress. So you are just callous about the risk of your actions. That's what it is. Ratio. Reckless means you are callous about the risk of your actions okay so although you do not directly so in this case the court said you should face the same liability as someone who does it willfully because your actions are so obviously likely to cause harm that you should have foreseen you should have seen uh, the risk you should have been able to appreciate the risk okay so uh, he must have foreseen the possibility of causing rich distress but the legal liability should be the same okay that's what the court said okay so you can see here an example of how in a later case you take a general rule which is stated in John Vier, in Wilkinson v Downton and you make it a little bit wider okay you decide that the same liability should apply even in a case of reckless uh, action okay so uh, one more point that the judge is uh, that the writer is talking about in Wilkinson v Downton is that uh, so he's talking about all the ways in which the rule in Wilkinson v Downton is probably too narrow it can be made uh, in a very just way 
it can be made a little bit wider one is what they did in Javier versus Sweeney that is also including reckless action okay any reckless action that causes kind of physical harm uh, or mental harm and then physical harm which uh, that will hold uh, that person should also be held liable in the same way that uh, a, a person who did it intentionally is going to be held liable and there's another element that the uh, author is mentioning here which is uh, he's crit criticizing the judgment in Wilkinson v Downton he's saying there was an unnecessary limitation in the judgment because you'll notice the judge meant uh, judge referred to the fact that plaintiff had been in normal health if you remember the judgment of judge uh, of right justice uh, in 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 this Wilkinson versus Downton case uh, further up in the note the judge mentioned that this lady was actually in normal health and even then she became ill with this nervous shock because of the lie told about her husband right she was in normal health now that the question is if the judge says something like that then the question will arise now what if she had not been in normal health what if she was anyway a very nervous person maybe she already was suffering from depression and all other kinds of mental illness and therefore she was anyway a person who is very easily frightened or very easily uh, goes into a state of nervous shock are you following what i'm saying she is in subpar health subpar mental health let's say so in that case because the judge mentions this thing he says plaintiff had been in normal health and if you mention something like this in the judgment the question will arise now what if the what if the uh, victim in another case is not somebody who is in normal health but is actually suffering from some diseases already is more vulnerable than a normal person right in that case should the uh, person who caused the the problem the harm that is downton should he also be held liable in the, that case where the victim was already in a weak uh, position and more susceptible than normal people are you following my question the question may arise now this what what the author is saying is that the judge made a mistake by mentioning this limitation there's no need for this limitation because we don't again once again remember the legal uh, remember the socio uh, socio political objective of uh, of all our laws we want to make people we want to incentivize people to behave in a responsible way towards others so nobody should have the advantage of like if i find somebody who is in already in poor health and i cause some dam uh, further damage to her health and then i say well i should not be held liable because she is already in poor health so whatever happened to her happened because of her pre-existing conditions and nothing to do with my actions are you following the logic that society does not want to give people this kind of opportunity to misbehave so therefore what this writer is saying is that in this case i mean in every case of such uh, tort the health of the victim is immaterial the vi victim may have been a person who is abnormal in the sense very very weak compared to other normal people in society even then the person who commits the offense should be held liable for all the damage that happens to the victim whether she is a person in very good health or whether she is a person in sub uh, subpar health whatever damage happens to the victim because of the uh, defendant's actions that defendant should be held liable for all that damage are you following the logic yes everybody follows because once again understand this that because why do we say this because we don't want to give people the advantage of taking advantage of people who are already quite sick and doing further harm to them and saying that whatever i did didn't really make a difference they were anyway quite sick so they would have whatever happened to them happened to them because of their pre-existing conditions yes is this clear Saini? you're following the logic yes so this is what he's saying so this is what the author is saying that the rule in wilkinson v downton can reasonably made be made even broader so in every at every step you can see that the way we decide to draw the line is basically ba is essentially based on our judgment of what is a fair and just rule for any society that this is how we want to incentivize people in society that uh, they should not take advantage of people who are already very sick now this rule that we have in tort law this rule is called the actual skull rule you can read about it more here okay uh, actual skull you can understand very easily it's a very graphic picture you know what an actual is very easy to crack right eggshells are very easy to crack so therefore you assume that your victim has a skull made of eggshell 
so it's gonna easily crack okay so therefore that's the point is that you have to assume that the victim is very weak and even then you can't do anything to them because we want to incentivize people to behave properly so uh, you, you assume that basically the the pre-existing conditions of the play of the defendant of the of the victim are no excuse for the person who causes the damage right that's what it, what, it, what this means it's a very uh, kind of a graphic name the actual this is the author has not mentioned this so but no essentially they're saying that every person this again comes from incentives do we do we want to frame our laws in every society in such a way that everybody had better behave in a responsible manner towards their fellow citizens so what we are saying to people is that in your actions towards your fellow citizens you better assume that everybody has a skull made of eggshells so you should not do even the slightest damage because their skull can crack because it's made of eggshells so you assume that everybody is very vulnerable are you following the logic because we want to incentivize people to behave properly so we are what we are telling people is that you better walk around in society assuming that all your fellow citizens have skulls made of eggshell so be very careful uh, about doing any kind of uh, damage to them any uh, hurting them in any way because if somebody happens to be very very weak anyway from pre-existing conditions and something severe happens to them you will be held liable for everything the previous condition of the victim is no excuse is this clear principles are very easy to understand once you understand the incentives that we are trying to create through a legal system this is clear okay see first is it will be very difficult to figure out how much of the damage was due to the pre-existing condition and how much is due to the uh, the actual offense caused by the uh, defendant right and the second is that because of this actual skull rule we are going to hold him liable for all the damage because we don't why do we do that because we don't want letter uh, some of you if you read the i gave you some optional readings and jurisprudence consequentialism versus deontology remember along, along the lines of positive and normative we gave you some distinctions which are not in the syllabus but this is called a consequentialist approach to rule making why do we make this rule saying that you better walk around assuming that everybody has a skull made of eggshells because we want to ensure that nobody takes advantage of some guy's weak uh, physical condition and then does some damage and says that that's not my fault because he was weak anyway are you following the logic so this is called a consequentialist view i what i do is before i make the rule i think about what will be the consequences of making this kind of rule okay like for instance after deducting marks now kushbu and single will not talk anymore so this is the consequence of having this kind of rule that it will make people behave or uh, and pay attention in the class or at least not talk in the class and that's why i made this rule okay so this is the consequentialist approach to rule making yeah 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 okay uh, uh, shivam can go first it's, it's made for that it's not been missing you said that it can't be missing yeah we basically and the person who who is defending for the claim can't be missing it no what do you mean by the person uh, like the victim you're talking about the victim or the person who made the who committed the offense you're talking about the victim no he will he can't misuse it because when you are claiming damages you have to show that you suffered the damages like in the case of the wilkinson versus downton they claim some medical expenses so she would have to show the medical bills so you can't really misuse it because everything is subject to fact checking by the court so the court when you come and make a claim before the court the court will determine whether the they will take evidence and see whether your claim is actually factually correct so we dummy can be created for the sake what dummy yeah. dummy receipt dummy. dummy expenses yes. okay the next time any dummy expenses i'll come to you okay no that uh, it that you have to take a chance on that because uh, it, you assume that the court is in a position to figure out the difference between fake expenses and real expenses that is part of the job of a court to understand whether the evidence is uh, uh, true or not or whether there is uh, fabrication of evidence 
whether the evidence is genuine or it is fabricated that is the job of a court now of course a court can also make a mistake yeah. right so that can happen but in general we expect the court to uh, be able to figure that out okay so like for instance in the recent case if you want to look at i don't know if you guys are following in such detail but uh, during the trump election campaign in 2016 and even after he got elected uh, elements of the fbi and the cia were spying yeah they were spying on his campaign they were spying even on his presidential uh, after he became president and the warrants that they got to spy on the president and the presidential candidate those warrants were based on fake information okay so it's like i'm saying that location the pakistani spy i'm fabricating some i'm fabricating some evidence which is actually not true but i have fabricated the evidence showing that he is a spy and then i'm getting a warrant to spy uh, to monitor his activities but the whole activity is illegitimate whatever i'm doing because the evidence that i used to get the warrant to spy on him that evidence was all fabricated it was not real okay so this can happen okay so this is an example a famous example in the recent past which where this has happened but generally we expect the court to be able to figure that out that's the duty of the court all right okay so uh, so this is clear one thing you have understood that how a ratio descendant of a case can be slightly expanded you can see many many ways in which it was expanded first the judge did not mention it as a as telling a lie he he laid down the rule as doing an act which is more general than telling a lie okay but then he used the word willfully doing an act which later in the case of jobby versus sweeney they widened the rule even more by saying not just willfully but even if you do it recklessly that's also the same kind of liability so you can can you see how the rule is getting moved around to the levels of uh, moved around different levels of generality can you see that and it is capable of being moved around and stated at different levels of generality then he's talking about the other unnecessary that the health of the victim is irrelevant the uh, previous health of the victim that's irrelevant so all these elements now we're going to come to this point of you see this whole distinction this whole discussion happening under the topic of distinguishing okay this article is not well drafted i've been saying that many times but they have not organized the ideas properly but anyway so um, the, why are we discussing this point distinguishing because if we go back to uh, so we'll now see what are the two types of distinguishing if you see your notes I've talked about two types of distinguishing very important to understand how litigation happens in these common law jurisdictions like India so on the point of stare decisis so generally when you're arguing a case in court in a common law jurisdiction like India you will be applying two things remember what we said that in common law cases in common law countries which are mixed jurisdictions so we will use both the uh, uh, statutory law and the codified law as well as the judicial precedents yeah okay so uh, Gagan you remember that we have to deduct marks you're supposed to uh, finish all your activities during the breaks so you have to deduct mark you want me, you want to go I, I'll have to deduct marks because I want to impose this rule otherwise people will keep on going out yes that's okay but I'll have to deduct marks so because again incentivizing people otherwise what happens is people keep going out and uh, you know it keeps on disturbing the class okay so we have to find Gagan all this is, you understand incentives you know what incentives are okay since this you remember everything you should always understand it's very important to understand any place where you're trying to find where the problem has arisen why the problem has arisen always look at incentives this is one law of economics which always applies okay which is that people respond to incentives right so in this case I've figured out that you guys are mostly many of you guys care about your grades so that we are hitting you where it hurts right to change your behavior so that is the logic because you always go for the incentives so there's a very famous statement you should know this is part of your learning as well whenever you're trying to analyze where the problem has happened in a particular case where why the fraud has happened okay there's a famous statement by have you guys heard of uh, uh, Warren Buffett yes, sir. okay have you heard of who is Warren Buffett's uh, uh, investment partner now that nobody knows Charlie Munger there's a guy called Charlie Munger who is uh, uh, Warren Buffett's investment partner okay so Charlie Munger has a very famous statement he says show me the incentive 
and I'll show you the crime. So whenever you see the crime, or any crime or any kind of malfeasance or governance problem, you always have to look at the incentives. Everything is driven by incentives. Okay. So um, we launched into a different kind of lecture, but anyway, these are also important things for you to understand. Okay. Uh, so when you argue a case in a court in India, you are usually going to be mentioning two things. You're going to be mentioning the codified law. For instance, if you have something, some dispute on the contract act, let's say on misrepresentation uh, in the contract act. So you will be looking at what is the wording of section 18 and how it should be worded, how it should be interpreted. That's one, but you will also be looking at uh, case laws that is uh, precedents are sometimes referred to as case laws so all judicial precedents you'll be looking at precedents and citing precedents precedents which will help your case remember in a court in india this is an adversarial system so you have lawyers for both sides each are each is showing each is trying to argue that the other guy is wrong right so this is called an adversarial system so both lawyers will be presenting precedents as case as uh, uh, you know judgments that should be followed in this particular case and the other party's ob objective obviously if i am showing particular if i am citing a particular case obviously it's good for me and bad for the other guy right that's obvious strategy wise if i'm citing a particular precedent okay uh, that's good for me and bad for the other guy so the other guy wants to make sure that the case that i'm citing as a precedent is not followed by the court obvious also strategy wise right because if i'm citing a particular case remember precedent what does precedent mean precedent means that it's a similar case it's a previous case on a similar uh, point right so if it's a robbery case that we are arguing in car, uh, in, uh, in court then we are citing another previous case, judgment on a similar robbery okay so therefore we are trying to argue that because the decision in the previous case was in this particular manner was given in this particular manner even in this uh, current case the decision should be made similarly because these are both cases of robbery that's what precedent means right so the idea of distinguishing comes in because each lawyer is trying to distinguish the precedent cited by the opposite side because I don't want that uh, those precedents to be applied by the court because if they're applied then I will lose are you following the logic the basic strategy whatever the other guy is saying must be wrong because otherwise if he's not wrong then I'm wrong then I lose the case so what we are trying to say by distinguishing the word distinguishing means that when we are distinguishing precedents let's write this here a little bit what is the meaning of distinguishing it will be easier to understand um, distinguishing briefly means uh, differentiating I'm just using a different word differentiating uh, previous I'm just gonna write it in shorthand previous judgments or type with one finger judgments cited by I'm using a uh, I'm using the word opposition. Opposition is not what the word we should use, but I want to use a short word. Opposition means the opposite lawyer. Okay. The opposite lawyer is citing certain judgments, which he thinks are applicable to this case. And I'm actually trying to differentiate those previous judgments cited by the opposition. Okay. Um, cited by the opposition. Um, differentiating previous judgments cited by the opposition from the um, facts of the current case I'm not writing the obviously to save time okay current right remember previous judgments is the precedent cited by the opposition and the current case is the case that we are right now fighting so the idea behind distinguishing is that I want to make sure that the precedents cited by the opposition are not applied by the court and therefore i want to differentiate those previous judgments cited by the opposition from the facts of the current case hence let's write all this here by 
by the code skipping the the are you following the logic we are trying we'll give you examples but what we're trying to show you is broadly what is meant by distinguishing in distinguishing in civil law uh, in common law jurisdictions litigation is held uh, is conducted in this manner that we will talk about the interpretation of the section and then we will talk about the uh, we will cite various uh, precedents okay that is previous judgments which we think are in our favor and we will say that these judgments are similar to the current case and they should be applied in the current case but the opposition is always going to try and prove that we are wrong okay because if we are not wrong then they are wrong and then they'll lose so therefore what we are doing is the idea of differentiating or distinguishing is whatever previous whatever precedence the opposition wants to apply we want to distinguish them that's our goal we want to distinguish them that is we want to differentiate those previous precedents from the facts of this case because we want to be able to say that those precedents should not be applied in this case are you following the logic you're getting the basic idea the opposition wants to cite some precedents as being applicable to this case my goal is to make sure the opposition loses so i want to distinguish those cases and differentiate them from the facts of this case and somehow make sure that the court does not apply those precedents to this case this is clear this is the big broad idea right it's almost like if somebody is let's say somebody has cited a particular precedent and we are arguing let's say a case of theft and i will try to show that this previous case that is cited by the opposite uh, by the opposite counsel is actually a case related to a divorce compensation so i'll say how should a, why should a divorce compensation case be applied in a case of theft it is no relation to the to current matter we try to find the dissimilarities yeah we try to find dissimilarities and distinguish our objective is make sure that whatever the other guy wants to apply doesn't get applied right because we want to defeat them right okay so this is the idea so there are two types of distinguishing which should we should be familiar with so we're going to look at that right now okay so this is what we are trying to understand the two types of distinguishing are let me just talk about it here let me just give you the examples and then uh, we'll see here are the two types of distinguishing restrictive and non restrictive maybe we should also put this in your notes two types of distinguishing we will put this here and um, I'll give you an example which some of you may like depending on your leisure time activities okay two types of distinguishing non restrictive and restrictive we'll explain what that is okay so first let's try and understand restrictive distinguishing okay let me give you an example of a case right now suppose a bunch of dsb one batch of dsb students goes to nus in singapore for a, a short program and then a bunch of students are caught smoking hookahs in the hostel in the nus hostel okay <coughs> so they are thrown out and nus then enacts a ban on all dsb students okay saying that dsb students smoke hookahs so they should not be allowed this is not allowed in the nus hostel so they should not be allowed to come to nus for classes all right okay is this clear so you can see the nus people almost like a judge a judge is making a ruling that dsb students should not be allowed to come to nus because they smoke hookahs in the hostel is this clear you understand this ruling okay you can relate to it right okay now let's assume that this may, obviously this is not true but let's assume that only girl only boys smoke hookahs okay so in this case if we can assume that only boys smoke hookahs and then we can also show that the facts of the case are such that the people smoking hookahs in the hostel were only boys okay so now we are trying to understand what is meant by restrictive distinguishing okay so the case what is happening is in the previous batch the students went there bunch of them were caught smoking hookahs nus the nus judge makes a ruling that dsb students are not to be allowed to come here because they smoke hookahs in the hostel all right so students obviously include males and females right so the ruling applies to both males and females now in the next batch the female students are arguing before the nus judge that this previous ruling from the last year by the nus judge should not be applied applied in the our case because that ruling is too wide what is it what is meant by too wide okay 
this is as you can see restrictive distinguishing is more than necessary yes previous judge has laid down this is what we are trying to understand restrictive very important to understand the concept i'm sure with uh, activity like hookahs involved you can understand it quite easily okay so uh, previous judge has laid down a rule that was unnecessarily wide for the decision of the case okay because what did the judge say in previous year in the previous year that all dsb students are not allowed to come to no dsb student allowed, all are banned so the next batch the girls are arguing that this previous year's decision was too wide we would like to restrictively distinguish that case and say that this is not applicable to our case because it is true that only boys smoke hookahs and it is also true that in that particular case all those who are caught smoking hookahs were boys so the judge failed to notice in the previous year while making the ruling the judge failed to notice an important fact in the case which is the gender of the offenders right they were all boys so the judge made a rule that was unnecessarily wide covering all students he should have made the rule covering only male students so the females this year are arguing that we should be allowed to go because females don't smoke hookahs right this is are you following the logic here this is what is meant by restrictive distinguishing so the females in this year are restrictively distinguishing the decision of the nus judge in the previous year where he said that all dsb students should be banned is everyone clear about this yes, so they are saying are you able to see that making a decision with respect to all dsb students is wider than making it with respect to only male students can you see that is everyone con convinced manisha sir are you convinced that if i make a rule that applies to all students that is a wider rule than if i make a rule applicable only to male students sir it is basically narrowing down it is basically narrowing down the only case for the relevant material yeah it is narrowing down and highlighting certain material facts in the old case in the previous in the precedent that is being cited which are too wide for the decision for the uh, it is too wide for the decision in the case remember you need the narrowest ruling narrowest possible uh, uh, logic the bare minimum logic to arrive at the decision okay so there was a relevant fact there was a relevant fact that uh, the gender of the offender should have been taken into account by the judge so understand i just want to make sure that everybody understands this that the uh, previous year's ruling with respect to all dsb students was much wider than a ruling with respect to only male dsp students is everyone clear about that that if i make a rule applicable to all students that is a wider ruling than something which is applicable only to male students is everyone clear about that we want to make sure that everyone understands the language yes i'm not getting an affirmative response some are looking out dead some have already given up yes very clear yes sir because the scope of the ruling is much wider because it covers both boys and girls but if the ruling should have actually been made only for the boys then it is a narrower ruling because the girls would have escaped right so therefore now what the girls so understand what is meant by the word restrictive distinguishing now the girls in this batch are arguing before the nus judge and they are restrictively distinguishing the ruling from the previous year the judgment from the previous year because they are saying that the judge failed to notice a relevant fact in the previous year's case which is the gender of the offenders and he should have made the ruling only for male students so the girls should be allowed to go is this clear so they can also argue that that this uh, particular ruling should be only for the, those particular people and not for the girls no but what well, yeah so that can also be done but in that case we assume we are we are trying to show just one particular aspect of it we are trying to show that so when we are trying to show this aspect of it we will assume that whenever guys go to nus they will smoke hookahs <laughs> have to assume that right so uh, so to to maintain parity in the class i mean if i tell them a bad joke about hookahs in the other class i have to tell you also the bad joke the, about hookahs in this class maybe we won't do that since we are recording this okay so but has everybody understood this point yes sir you all understood this point so we are using this instant this story 
to uh, illustrate to you what is meant by restrictive distinguishing where you are saying that the previous uh, judgment the judgment that is cited in this uh, cited for your case your current case the scope of that the the width of the ratio is too much the ratio was incorrectly framed because the judge failed to see this is where you see the theoretical point okay the theoretical point here is given here you can see this exp exp uh, you can see the explanation here in the text, uh, text of the article you can read what it is but now that you have understood the example you can understand it in a more theoretical point what is mentioned here is only this that when you are engaging in this kind of restricted distinguishing this is a more theoretical explanation your current case has only material facts b and c but the case that is being cited as a precedent actually had an additional fact a which was also material in this case in the previous case but the judge failed to notice it okay like in this case we would say that the gender of the offenders would be the factor a so the judge failed to notice the gender of the offenders and the fact that only boys smoke hookahs and he missed that fact and therefore he made a ruling applicable to all students which was unnecessarily wide so in the next batch the girls are seeking to restrictively distinguish that judgment by saying that the previous judgment uh, the scope of the ratio is too wide because the judge failed to notice a relevant fact this is clear this is all that is mentioned in this part here the rule makes no reference to fact A, that is the gender of the offenders and the fact that only boys smoke hookahs, which existed in the case and which we regard as a material fact and as a fact that ought to have been introduced in the ratio resonity of the previous case, which was not done. That's why the ambit of the uh, ratio is too wide and we are restricting the ambit of the ratio and that's how we are distinguishing this case. This is called restrictive distinguishing. This is much less common, okay, much rarer but you should understand this point it's a very important point but i've given you an example which i think you should be able to relate to okay non-restrictive distinguishing is simply very uh, it's much easier to understand it's distinguishing based on facts remember the goal is always to distinguish because it's adversarial litigation in common law countries you have to prove that the opposition is wrong because if they're not wrong then you're wrong then you lose so whatever they say you have to prove is wrong so they're citing some precedents you have to find a way to distinguish those cases so that they are not applied to the to the current judgment which you are fighting for right you have to distinguish differentiate and thereby show that they are not applicable here okay so the two ways you distinguish is one is restrictive and one is non-restrictive non-restrictive i'll give you an example let's say that we have a pre uh, a precedent in the previous precedent case let's say there was let's say a case of dui dui is actually a u.s term from u.s criminal law what does dui stand for driving under influence correct so driving under the influence of alcohol all right so dui is a pretty serious offense in the u.s if you get caught for dui they will essentially just ruin your life so this is a very serious in india it's not so serious but there it's very serious so dui let's say we have a case of dui where you actually also cause damage okay plus plus injuries okay so in this case that's a precedent that is being cited a precedent of dui where injuries were caused to a pedestrian right person was driving under the influence and caused injuries uh, to a pedestrian and now your current case where your client okay is also being uh, prosecuted for a situation where uh, in a car accident somebody was injured and your client was driving the car okay but now what's happening is the prosecution seeks to apply this previous case the precedent where a person with uh, under who was uh, engaged in dui and caused injuries was given a very severe penalty so now the prosecution is saying since you are also your case also you have uh, there is a case of injuries on account of a car accident and you were driving the car so you should also be subject to the same penalty okay now you have to protect your client so you have to somehow show that he should not face these penalties so what you do is you highlight certain facts in your case which are materially different so you show that first of all there is another factor a which is not drunk 
your client was not drunk okay second and then you have another client okay b and c you can see are common here that is car accident injuries etc okay uh, now yes another point which you cite in your case in your client's case is that the car was defective that means the brake failed or the steering went out of control i don't know if you guys know that there's a brand called lexus are you aware of lexus yes, it's a toyota luxury brand there was a problem with lexus steering wheels in the us uh, some time ago they were just going auto uh, they were automatically steering and uh, automatically picking up speed okay so there was some defect uh, programming defect in the car and they were just basically going out of control on their own and there were a few accidents based on that so that recall some of the cars so you show that there is another material fact in your case not only was your client not drunk your client wasn't drunk and then in in this case there was a defect in the car the brake failed or the steering went out of control on its own and then the accident happened so you can see here the stack circumstances are quite different that your client really should not have any liability because he didn't do anything wrong he was not driving recklessly he was not drunk the car went out of control and that's why the accident happened are you able to see how we can show different facts right so it is not a case of dui it's not a case of reckless driving but there are other material facts so because of these facts i would say that my client should not be subject to the same penalties that were given and given out in this case because the facts were materially different okay my client should have very little liability because he didn't really do anything wrong it's just bad luck right are you following the logic yes people are not convinced so here if you notice why is this called non restrictive distinguishing because here i'm not trying to say that the precedent that has been cited the ratio of that case was too wide i'm not trying to say that i'm not saying anything about the ratio of that particular case unlike the previous situation <laughs> but i'm saying simply that this my current current case has different material facts okay and therefore it does not match on certain material facts okay we are not saying that the court did not consider any material facts which were present in the previous case that's not what we are saying which we were saying over here i'm just saying that the material facts of the precedent case are different from the material facts of my case because in the precedent case uh it's not that the client was the client was actually drunk my client was not drunk in the previous case in the precedent case the car did not go out of control there was no car defect in the car in my case there was a defect in the car are you following this so i'm trying to show that the facts are different and once again what is my objective my objective is to make sure that this precedent is not applied in my case because if it is applied then i'll have a problem right are you following the logic what people are looking very blank is it because of the time of day no, after lunch so i got to feel okay what is the problem if you are not able to connect what is the problem then you have to ask me the question i am glad that you actually have said it many people are just not saying anything it's a little theoretical but you have to understand this because it helps you these are all finer points of understanding of a case the first part you understood focus and all that part you understood okay so that is easier to understand so now in this case like you said in the first precedent case he was in a influence and then the plant had injuries yes but then in the next case you were saying that he was not in a influence yeah and it was the fault of the car yes which caused injuries then how are the two cases same <laughs> that they are not the same one minute try to understand good this is how you question this is how you clarify this is why he illustrates why exactly you ask questions in the class so to clarify your own understanding because everybody has to understand it in their own way right okay that is the whole point they are not the same even how it like in the uh, restrictive distinction you were telling it was related that dsb students are banned so yeah. a set as a whole were dsb students in this case the uh, material facts have completely changed yeah and how can we cite a referral of an no that they will do that lawyers will do lawyers will always take a chance lawyers will always take a chance and see if the uh, precedent works okay they don't they are not going to take care to see that they are always going to be correct they will just take a chance with any case that suits them now it is your job as the opposing lawyer to show that this case is to be distinguished from your case all right 
So, so the basic reason, the basic connection comes because, quiet here please. The basic connection comes because this B and C are the same. There is a car accident, let's say B is a car accident and then C is the injuries to the pedestrian. Okay, these two are the same. So the prosecution is saying, now here is a previous case where there was a car accident and injuries to the pedestrian and the uh, defendant got five years jail. So in this case, your client also should get five years jail. But then you look into the facts of that particular precedent case and you see that there the defendant was drunk he was driving recklessly and there was no mechanical problem with the car okay so you highlight when you investigate the previous case the precedent case you find that it has very important differences on material facts and now you point out that my client was not drunk my client's car was physically defect there was a mechanical defect in the car like the brake failed or something so therefore you argue before the judge that because the material facts are very different therefore this precedent should should not be applied in our case. Are you clear now? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so at least Utsa will ask the question, but I'm sure many other people are also not clear, but they're not asking the question. Okay, so you have to engage. I, I understand it's a little bit theoretical, but part of being an MBA student is also being comfortable with theoretical discussions. This is something that people expect from you. Okay, you're not just going out as a programmer or uh, you know some other kind of technical civil engineer or something like that. You are an MBA student, so you are willing. You are required to be comfortable with discussing abstract concepts, disc having theoretical discussions. This is something that is expected of MBA students. Okay, so if you find it difficult, your job is to engage and ask a question like Uttar has done, rather than just switching off and going into your own, uh, you know, what should we say, Samadhi. Yeah? Like, uh, Samadhi is like a state of deep meditation, where you, you know, go into, you haven't heard the term Samadhi, that is used for meditation, right? Okay, so, alright, quiet. Now, have you understood this point, these two points? Yes, Jagyasa, you want to ask a question? No? You have understood? You have not understood and you don't want to ask a question. Okay, so go back and revise this stuff. It's not that complicated, okay? These are new concepts. These are a little bit, a little bit theoretical, a little bit abstract. But if you make an effort to understand it, you will understand it. You have to just make an effort, that's all. Go back and revise and understand it. It's an important theoretical point to understand. What is restrictive distinguishing? I gave you a very easy example to understand. Okay. Uh, and non-restrictive where you don't seek to, I'll just come to you. Uh, where you don't seek to restrict the ratio of the precedent in any way. But you try to show that the current case is different from the precedent on very important material facts. Okay. Not that the court fa failed to notice some material facts, no, but in your case there are some other material facts which make the case very different, the, your case very different. Yes, sure, yeah. what's the question? My question is that in the first uh, descriptive case, like they said that only boys vote, okay, so that is like a... Uh, they didn't say that, they sh the, this year's girls are arguing that they should have said that. They should have said that. They failed, to, the girls this year are arguing that they should have noticed these facts that only boys smoke hookahs and those who are smoking were all boys. So the ruling should have been made only to be applicable to boys, not to the female students. That's what this year's girls are arguing. Because last year they gave the judgment based uh, applicable to all DSB students, yeah. male and female. So what would be like ABC of the uh, this uh, Here, A, what we are saying is gender. Okay. See, remember, if you go and read below, this article is not very well organized, but uh, it's got all the points here and there. Okay, that's why I'm mentioning it. If you read it along with the discussion, then you'll understand. So when the girls this year are arguing, what are they saying? This is the theoretical representation of the uh, of the situation of restrictive distinction. What are the girls saying this year? This year's girls are saying that there was a material fact in the previous year's case which is the gender of the offenders and the fact that only boys smoke hookahs okay we can call that a1 a2 two facts which what they're saying notice very important fact and a very important feature of restrictive distinguishing is you actually say that um, here 
understand this guys please for restrictive distinguishing okay maybe i should not have put the um, non-restrictive right below that because i wanted to contrast it in restrictive distinguishing what happens is you are actually saying that there was a material fact in the precedent case which the court failed to notice like the court failed to notice the gender of the offenders and the fact that the boys only boys smoke hookahs all right this is a very important difference between restrictive and non-restrictive in restrictive distinguishing you are making an allegation that there was a material fact in the previous case which the court failed to notice is this clear then right then, uh, in the non-restrictive one we do that not make such an allegation we do not make such an allegation. allegation we don't say that the court failed to notice any material fact all we are saying is that in my case there are some other important material facts like my client wasn't drunk as was the case in the precedent case as was true in the precedent case my client's car had some mechanical problems which was not true in the precedent case so i'm citing some relevant facts from the current case which are very different from what was happening in the precedent case is this is clear yeah shiva quiet guys please quiet rest of you should be quiet yeah no no i i agree with your first statement your second statement is a little bit more uh, not so well uh, uh articulated maybe the first statement is true that if you notice even the glanville williams article itself it says that no two cases have the exact, exact same facts all right that will never be true but the point is like the victim is wearing a red shirt and next victim might be wearing a blue shirt so there's already you have a difference but material facts so but material facts can be the same in many cases material facts can be the same in many cases like if you take one case of drunken driving reckless driving while under the influence you can have many such cases so if you can find another case which is actually has the same material facts and no other material facts which are different okay like none of this a and d none of this a and d business is present only b and c reckless driving while drunk here also reckless driving while drunk nothing else which is different material facts then again you will have the same penalty then and i want to say like the first case in the morning and the current case can be in the night that's also material fact that it can change the order yeah if you can show that if you can show that that has a material bearing on what actually happened or that should have a material bearing on the liability right because if you are talking about night you are only talking about visibility problems or what you are trying to say right so if you can show in some way that it has a material bearing on the liability of the defendant then it can then it can be considered by the court right okay so uh, are you able to follow this this is clear now please make sure you go back and revise if you don't revise remember this whole business of mugging up stuff which you are used to in your undergraduate those things have to stop now you have to get used to you have to be comfortable with abstract concepts you have to be comfortable with understanding concepts understanding theoretical concepts and being applied able to apply it to uh, situations okay so right now it's a little bit dry because we haven't got into the judgments yet so just bear with me and you also have to get used to discipline if you get bored you don't go and start talking to another person you force yourself to concentrate okay what is so difficult about that you have to train yourself you guys have all become soft because you have come from this weak undergraduate culture that we have in our country where people are just having fun most of the time so you have just become soft you have to train yourself to be tougher now that's all okay so so this you can see restrictive distinguishing is mentioned that now you can read on the on your own and understand this point so this is one of the important points of this article 
what is the ratio descendendi how do we distinguish it from the arbiter dictum and then what are the two types of distinguishing right which are important because you always want to be able to make a distinction and ensure that whatever precedence the opposite side is cite citing are uh, not to be applied okay uh, not to be applied to your case so arbiter dictum is basically you can read this on your own is anything that is not part of the ratio descendendi okay anything that not part of the ratio and the, the earlier part of the article i mentioned that in ratio descendendi in understanding the ratio descendendi of the case you try to focus on the bare minimum logic that is required to arrive at the decision in the case okay the bare minimum logical reasoning that is a lot, uh, required remember every judgment has to be based on some reasoning you can't just give a judgment like okay this guy is guilty why is he guilty you have to explain every court has to explain right so in the explanation that's where we look at we look at the bare minimum logical reasoning that is required to come to the decision in the case all right and everything else is what we call arbiter dicta so you can say examples you can read all this on your own okay uh, what is meant by arbiter dicta various hypotheticals all kinds of stuff okay which so so remember here the rule of stare decisis we are not required to follow the arbiter dicta so the another the other rule that judges use in uh, that lawyers another another trick that lawyers use in, in courtrooms is that if somebody is citing a case if my opposition is citing a case and trying to argue that this is the ratio of this case another thing i'll try to do is i'll try to show that no this is not part of the ratio of this case this is just arbiter because arbiter whatever is arbiter i'm not required to follow remember the rule of stare decisis means only the ratio descendendi has to be followed so in addition to the distinguishing part another trick that lawyers use is to try and argue that whatever the other side is saying is the ratio of the case is actually not the ratio of the case because remember this is not like science or physics or sorry, physics and stuff like that so there is some disagreement on what is the ratio of a particular case so you can even have arguments on that but the idea is to show that something is not part of the ratio of the case but it's really arbiter because if you can show that it's arbiter then you don't have to follow the logic you don't have to follow that ruling okay so we are approaching the end that's why people are getting very optimistic yes arbiter dicta is essentially it's like a residual concept you understand what is residual left over you guys have done accounting net worth is a residual concept you take total assets from that total assets you subtract outside liabilities all the loans and debt that the company has you forgot in all your accounting okay net worth is a residual concept go back and revise that also total assets minus outside liabilities residual which means anything that is not part of the owner's equity okay everything else is outside liabilities all the debt and everything else is. so total assets minus outside liabilities is net worth okay net worth is a residual concept whatever is left over from after deducting outside liabilities from your total assets whatever is left over is your net worth residual concept arbiter dicta is also a residual concept whatever the court has said in what in the particular judgment right but it's not a part of the ratio descendendi so if it says it's not a part of the ratio descendendi okay so for instance in this case if you go back to the case of the nus judgment on the hookah smoking right the nus uh, judge might have said that uh, however if these guys were smoking cocaine then we would have punished them given them the death penalty and all that now those are all arbiter because that is not what they were doing they were smoking hookahs so any kind of hypo anything that is not relevant uh, anything which is not relevant to the actual core decision in the case all the residual is arbiter dicta okay so remember if you ever go to singapore singapore is very strict on these things okay so please do not no hanky panky when you are going to singapore so all right okay so people are getting very restless we haven't been okay i'll i'll just briefly we have some we have a couple of minutes so i'll just give you some guidance one sec guys please 
Okay, I'm just going to give you some guidance so you can finish this topic on your own. It's very simple. You you do the readings on your own. Okay, uh, let's figure out what else you have to do. Read a little bit about the case analysis framework. We will see it la later uh, once again when we start doing the cases. Okay, a little bit on the case analysis framework. Then cover all this stuff. Read all this stuff on your own. Acts, rules and regulations. Let me just highlight these are all topics okay case analysis framework is a topic then acts rules and regulations what are the differences between acts rules and regulations okay rules essentially made by parts of the executive branch closer to the head of the ex like cbdt central board of direct taxes much closer to the prime minister's office than let's say a body like sebi which is quite independent okay SEBI is quite independent, although it still is appointed, the people are appointed by the central government. So these slightly more distant bodies, the, the things they make up, those are called regulations, the others are called rules. Their act is just the law without the rules, all right? Okay, so you read all this stuff, various types of jurisdiction, uh, types of jurisdiction, second type of jurisdiction, all this you read, okay, and finish types of orders, these kinds of laws standards of proof up to here only the rest is optional okay so you finish this reading on your own if you have any questions because this is just basic textbook stuff okay if you you read it on your own and i'm going to move on to contract law in the next class so if you have any problems with seeing some of these other concepts uh you just you ask me okay and then i'll explain it is this clear is it a fair deal yes okay anything is fair now because the time is up right okay all right okay you can guys you guys can go i've taken 47 seconds 50 seconds extra